Let us come to God in prayer. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be open to know your truth and your way. Amen. When was the last time that you cut yourself some slack? Before the pandemic hit, we were already being consumed by a culture that encourages, if not requires, proficiency and is slow to offer grace and forgiveness. Then this pandemic hits, all of a sudden we have to completely reinvent the way that we do our job or maybe even find a whole new job. It has turned full-time workers into full-time teacher's assistants while schooling at home and has taken away the many vacations and activities to be excited about, yet, we still may be expecting the same high level of proficiency in ourselves that we were before. That equation just doesn't seem to add up. In the 1980s, sociologist Ing Bell encouraged an exercise based off of Tibetan meditations. She had the following instructions. For 20 minutes, walk around your room as slowly as possible without losing your balance. It may take you 10 minutes to just cross the room. Just concentrate on the body feeling of walking slowly. Don't do anything special with your mind. Let it relax and go along for the ride. Now for the rest of your day, do all your custom tasks at about 50% of its normal speed, even less when it's possible. Walk to class slowly. Take notes slowly. Eat your lunch slowly. Do your assignments slowly. Go on your date slowly. After instructing some of her students to do this, they returned awestruck with the results that it yielded. They not only found that they actually enjoyed it, despite it sounding frustrating, they actually all reported to be able to get more done in their day. They were more productive doing things slowly, more carefully, with more of themselves and their bodies in mind. She connects this to how when runners are told to run at 80% capacity, they get better times at rather than if they run at their full speed. You don't get burnt out or fatigued as easily. There's more listening to what your mind and your body and your soul needs. I've experienced this in my own life. A few times I've gone on a spiritual retreat to Holy Cross Monastery in West Park, New York. It's an Anglican Benedictine men's monastery that has a large focus on hospitality. When you go, you meet for prayer in their chapel about four to five times a day. People are doing puzzles in the common room. Everything smells like incense. You stay in modest living quarters. It's slow. It's all done in Gregorian chants. There's Eucharist once a week, sometimes even weeks of complete silence. And the first time I went, I had very little idea what to expect. I was mid-semester at seminary, so I was looking at a large, stressful mid-semester midterms coming up. I'd be going to all these prayers and eating all these meals in communities so I wouldn't be able to work on papers or study note cards while eating dinner. And I really thought I'd done myself a disservice by taking this retreat. But let me tell you, I've never in my life so quickly and efficiently wrote my papers. I never felt so prepared for my exams. I think it was the only time during seminary that I actually got full night's sleep. By slowing down, by taking the time to check in on how I was doing, what my mind and my body and my spirit needed, by taking time aside to include God even more into my daily life, I was far more productive and I was far more happy in my work. I'm just chomping at the bit to be able to go visit there again. This very much connects to last week's focus on Sabbath, and we transition into the series on forgiving ourselves. And this sounds nice, right? Forgive ourselves, but it's so essential for our spiritual growth. We spend a lot of time learning how to forgive others, which is difficult enough to do on its own, but if we aren't also offering ourselves that same grace that we learn to offer others, then we've completely missed the mark. And speaking of Mark, today's text about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane comes from Mark's gospel, but is, it's a story that's told in some fashion by all four gospel writers. 
John's is a little tougher to identify. Luke talks about it for about 0.5 seconds. Matthew has a lot more focus on Peter. Despite these differences, a a theme seen throughout is Christ's anguish, his true, very real, very human, very unapologetic fear for what is to come. He doesn't want to do it. He's given everything he's got and desperately doesn't want to go through the suffering and sacrifice that he sees ahead. Now, I said in Friday's mailing that I wouldn't sing any Jesus Christ Superstar, so I will restrain myself, but I will quote a little bit. In Jesus' beautiful song that he sings in the Garden of Gethsemane, he refers to the three years of ministry leading up to this moment. He begins in a rather exhausted and exasperated way, saying that those three years felt like 30 years. And that number later increases to three years feeling like 90 years. And yes, I understand that this is an artist's musical rendition of this biblical moment, but it exemplifies the real despair and heartache we read in today's text. Gethsemane, This location where Jesus goes to pray actually means oil press. At that time, an oil press was a device where a wooden wheel turned within another wooden wheel, crushing olives to push liquid into a trough. Immense pressure was placed on the olive in order to yield results. And so it seems rather fitting that Jesus chose the spot to reveal his heart to God. He was under immense pressure and was having trouble managing the unease that came with that. In Luke, it even says his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Many scholars explain this moment as something of a panic attack. Yes, Jesus having a panic attack. In today's text, there are many very human yet very different actions happening all at the same time. We have Jesus Jesus experiencing real anxiety and fear. I'm very sad, it's as if I'm dying, he says. Even his being fully divine, even in his absolute unwavering faith, knowledge of the redemption and resurrection, he still is in despair. He still begs for his suffering to be over. He still pours out his heart to God in prayer. The first thing we need to realize is that being scared is so human and doesn't mean that we don't have enough faith in God. If a loved one gets bad news from a doctor, is waiting more test results, and tells you that they're frightened, would you not empathize with that fear? Would you not see that that could be a terrifying position to be in and try to comfort them in that anxiety? Of course you would. So why, when it comes to ourselves, are we all of a sudden, well, I'm not weak, I'm stronger than that, I don't have time to panic, the Bible tells me not to fear, I'm not going to fear. No, Jesus is terrified. Do you forgive Jesus for being scared in that moment? Why not yourself? On Christmas morning and Good Friday, we celebrate Christ being fully human, but the rest of the time? We seem to disregard that and only focus on his being fully divine. Healings, miracles, wisdom. Here in his life, we see him very human, very vulnerable, very scared. Jesus doesn't walk into this prayer resigned. He wants his fears known. But we also see Peter, James, and John, the first three disciples that Jesus calls falling folly to human error. They saw him rise Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the dead. They were there at the transfiguration, up on the mountain, surrounded by light and flanked by Moses and Elijah. They believe in Christ, the Son of God. Yet, they were asked to stay awake, to keep watch, and instead fell asleep. They are often criticized by modern readers, mocked even for not being able to stay awake, to keep watch while Christ pours out his heart in agony and prayer. And yes, of course, it's like your friend is clearly not okay and you can't stay awake for 60 minutes. But they are taking another approach to anxiety and suffering. They're sleeping, finding that the world is overwhelming and chaotic and that sometimes it's easier to be criticized for sleeping than to deal with the real tragedy that's occurring. That's also a very real coping mechanism that happens. I find this to be very true in my own life. 
There are times when too much is happening and there's too many things to worry about and I start to get a headache. For the longest time, I try to power through those moments. Nope, I can handle this. Just give me some coffee. But I've come to realize that I'm really not that helpful like this. So sometimes if it's all too much, I just take a nap. Remove myself from it all for a short period, and then I find that I'm much more productive in that I need to remember that I'm only human. Forgive myself for not being able to do everything all the time. They say that pastors should write sermons for themselves, not their congregations. So I think I wrote the sermon for myself. In many ways, this text is a cry for self-care and awareness of our own mental well-being. In this global fight to maintain physical health, the already very pressing need for expansion and access to mental and behavioral health services has increased exponentially. Let me share a few alarming statistics with you. According to the National Health Council, since mid-February, there have been more than 88,000 additional positive depression and anxiety screening results in the U.S. over what has been expected using the previous year's data. In the month of April, depression screenings increased by 394%, and as of May, anxiety screenings have increased by 370% over that of January per day. In one out of four of those screenings, the themes of grief, loss, and financial issues were mentioned. Those with chronic health conditions that leave them more vulnerable to COVID are in the 75 to 80% range for depression or anxiety. Younger populations are actually being hit particularly hard with anxiety and depression. In May, these populations were experiencing higher rates of anxiety and depression than any other age group with anxiety rates around 80% and depression rates about 90% of the youth and young adults being screened. National depression rates of 90%. Having mental health challenges, particularly when under immense strain, is just part of being human. We shouldn't need to forgive ourselves for acknowledging our humanity and asking for help. But if offering yourself some forgiveness is what you need to get that help, then do that. Forgive yourself for not being super mom or for aiming for grades in school that just get you the degree or for putting away that constantly beeping phone in the sock drawer for an hour. Many years ago, I jotted down a line from one of my father's sermons where he said, forgiveness alone decides whether or not that failure, that evil, that wrong is final and life-defining, or whether there's life beyond it. And I always thought of this in terms of forgiving someone else. My authentic, true, deep, in my core forgiveness for someone else frees me from any resentment or trying to prove myself or any hold that that may have on me. And yes, that's true. But I've also come to realize that that forgiveness also needs to be extended to myself. I will not get to life beyond my failures and mistakes unless I forgive myself for it, unless I let myself off the hook for not being perfect, unless I can say, yeah, maybe in hindsight, I could have tried a little harder or done something different, but I made the best choice I could. I really did try. Why have we convinced ourselves that we have to be superhuman? God. Jesus gets emotional, needs to talk about what's going on in the world, needs to express feelings. They say that the best counselors see a counselor. It's kind of why I often get a little shaken when people say things like, oh, the God of the Old Testament is a little too wrathful. I prefer the God of the New Testament. First, the same God. But second, and I think this is really important, God is emotional. God does experience anger and sadness and loss. It's all over scripture. These traits, these feelings that we experience for the good and the bad are God-given. I'm glad that God gets angry sometimes because I get angry sometimes. And sometimes I get angry for very legitimate reasons. I should be angry. God gets angry about the mistreatment of the poor, about injustices, about marginalized people being treated harshly by those in power so should we. A friend of mine shared what can seem like a minor but yet very embarrassing moment he had 
but was met with grace that he has since learned to offer himself also, he writes. When I was in college, I was part of a men's Bible study that met at Starbucks every Thursday morning at 6 a.m. I was the only college student, but I really enjoyed the group despite feeling like an outsider due to my age sometimes. I often felt insecure that I didn't get up until 8 a.m. on most days, so it was hard to make it across town by bike on crisp mornings by 6 a.m. And one week, it was my turn to lead the Bible study, and I was really grateful for the opportunity, particularly due to my age. I prepared, I met with my pastor to discuss, and when Thursday came, though, I almost had a panic attack at 7.30 a.m. I had totally overslept and missed the whole thing. I was embarrassed, ashamed, and scared to face my peers and pastor's anger and disappointment. Yet, I was surprised to notice uh, a graceful email informing me that someone else took charge of the small group when it was apparent that I wasn't going to be there. I emailed the group that night to apologize, included the day's lesson plan. I was so encouraged by my pastor's quick, simple reply. Thanks for the note. We forgive you and extend grace to you. We all appreciate you, and thanks for sending the lesson. Such a short note, but so much grace is in that. It's stuck with me ever since. I merited criticism, but received forgiveness instead. I was and still only human. I really look forward to further exploring forgiveness for the next few weeks. Sometimes when I step back and think about forgiveness, I get sort of breathless by the fact that forgiveness, whether for another or for yourself, is a very divine trait. I'm thankful that we have some capacity to offer it and to experience it. We need more of it. Ultimately, it's God's forgiveness that enables us to forgive not only others, but ourselves. We learn in Christ's own humanity more about our humanity, more about what it means to be a person who won't always get everything right, who will at times be overwhelmed and anxious. We see Christ exemplify the need for self-care, for a chance to slow down, for people to turn to when they need help, and for the necessity of prayer in our lives. 